Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Aberdeen City Libraries. It is a pleasure to welcome you all here, whether you're here with us in the audience or joining us online. It's wonderful to have you with us for this, our first Book Week Scotland event. Um, Book Week Scotland's now in its 10th year, and the theme for Book Week Scotland this year is celebrate. And honestly, what better way to celebrate than to be able to have all of you here in person and online for our first hybrid event, author event, in our library since March of 2020. <laughs> so thank you all so much for joining us this evening, however you're joining us. Um, helping us get our celebration started is local author Deborah Masson. Over the course of the evening, we will be having a chat with Deborah about her award-winning books, writings and so much more. There will be the opportunity for you, the audience, in the library and online to put your questions to Deborah. Those of you in the audience in here in the Central Library, if you just put up your hand, colleagues will get the mics to you. If you're joining us online, please by all means put your questions and comments in the chat and colleagues will relay them to them and we'll put your questions to Deborah for you. Deborah Martin. Crowned the winner of Bloody Scotland's Scottish Crime Debut of the Year 2020. Aberdeen's newest crime writing queen, or should I say queen? Aberdonian born and bred. Deborah, <laughs> <laughs> Deborah Masson is the best selling author of the D.I. Eve Hunter series. Hold your tongue and out for blood. Deborah, thank you so much for joining us this thank evening. Thank you so much for having me along. Chuffed a bit to be here. Oh, um, we're but a normality returning. And I'm just. <laughs> up in the chair without showing my underwear, so thank you. <laughs> we are delighted you could join us and help us celebrate Book Week Scotland. Now, I find this hard to believe. You're now in book two of the series. You are a prize-winning author. But beforehand, we were chatting, and this is actually on your second, third in-person event. Yeah, because my debut, Hold Your Tongue, came out um, just before the first lockdown. So everything that I've really done to date has been either podcasts or it's been Zoom calls or things like that. So I did have ones booked with my debut, but of course they all got cancelled, as we all know, into lockdowns. But um, yeah, I had Granite Muir at the Lemon Tree um, and I've been under a rock for the last two years and now here I am in person again. So it's lovely to be out. <laughs> A very busy rock, it must be said. Well, it's been a busy rock, but yeah, it's lovely to be out. Because in that time, because your first book came out in December 2019, mm -hmm. Boxing Day. Yep. We all went into lockdown in March 2020. We did. And in that time, you made it as a prize-winning author. And you also completed book number two. And book number three is on its way. Yeah. So what can you tell us? How did you get started? How did it feel to be writing? Lockdown was crazy for all of us, but lockdown as an author, yeah. how was it? I think um, it was difficult because I think when I came into writing, it was really um, after working full time in lots of different jobs, um, did courses and that to find myself where I was at. Um, and really it was something I picked up when my eldest now, who is going to be 12, was two. And I did it when she was napping in the mornings and afternoons for a little bit of sanity, because when you come from full-time work to mum at home, it's a bit of a shock. Um, and it kept the sanity going. So really, when we went into lockdown, it was like almost returning to that again, except this time I had both kids home, but this time at school age. Yeah, and having to yeah, educa educate them. Hmm. I don't know if that's what I've managed to do, as many of us know, is trying to be, you know, at home kind of teachers, which we're not trained to do, but trying to do that, um, when I had, some, I had one in primary one um, and one in primary six, so either ends, you know, um, and trying to hit deadlines, definitely an experience, because being a creative thing, you need that space and that silence, or at least I do, I wish there was someone that could type away heavy metal music and everything like some people, but I can't, so yeah. It was a struggle, like everyone else, we've all been there in our own way, so. 
Many plates spinning, but some yeah. fanta fantastic plates because your books are just wonderful. Oh, thank but you. how did you get started? Because if anybody follows Deborah on um, social media, you'll know that Debbie posted up a picture just the other week, in fact, just the other day, of her as a wee girl at a typewriter. Um, did you set out to be a writer? Because that's not always been your career path. Yeah, I think without sounding too twee, I was always writing stories. But back then, it was like about fairies at the bottom of the garden, and you know, it wasn't about murder and blood and gore that it is now, but a lot more innocent. Um, and I enjoyed it, you know, as a child. Um, loved English at school and things. Um, but as I say, I really picked it up when. I came out of full-time work and I found myself at home and I needed something just for me to keep the old grey matter ticking over, you know, because you all of a sudden find yourself at the surrender of this baby, you know, and you kind of lose yourself, as I'm sure a lot of mothers, you know, can relate to. And I just needed something to, to keep me going. So for a start, it was really just scribbling, doing flash fiction, short stories, um, and I got brave enough with my second short story to send it away to a competition. I was delighted when I got second place. And that gave me a little bit of confidence and encouragement because it can be a very insular thing. Mm. You've no idea if you're good at it. But when you get that bit of recognition, it spurs you on to, to follow it. Um, so yeah, it started off with a six week um, introduction to crime writing through the Professional Writing Academy, which was an online course. Um, and I followed that through. And my reason for picking that was because it's what I read. So I thought, you know, let's, okay. let's try and write what we read. And I was an avid crime fiction reader, passing books back and forth with my mum. And, you know, we, we shared them like they were going out of fashion. Um, and then that led on to a one-year course with Faber Academy. Um, and again, the feedback, the support of my tutor, Tom Bromley, who was wonderful. Um, also, the, the peer support from fellow students, when you're getting that constructive feedback. Um, that was where the seeds of Hold Your Tongue were born. Oh, yeah. um, and then by the end of that one year course, I thought, hmm, I could maybe do something with this. So really, my debut was the first book I ever tried to, tried to write. So. Oh my gosh. But yeah, so it was, it was great. I don't think without that deadlines, um, without that support and that motivation to keep turning up at the desk, I don't think I would have done it on my own. So I'm a big supporter of courses and yes, you can be taught how to write, you know. So how did you go from an idea hmm. to the Faber Academy to being published? Because your books got picked up by Transworld. Mm -hmm. and so how did that all happen then? Um, Initially, I mean, going back to the creation of the, the actual character, the idea kind of came about on the six-week course. Right. So we were given a scenario where we had to think about a detective, we had to think about a murder scene. Um, we had to show that detective having breakfast, of all bizarre things, but it really did get you into that character. You know, just a mundane daily thing that got you thinking and ticking about their mannerisms and, mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. And then... Uh, we had to show that detective interviewing um, a suspected murderer. So that really got me thinking about, well, what could the murder be? What happened? Which got me on to what Hold Your Tongue's all about. Um, and then, yeah, I followed that through the courses. And then at the end of the course, um, I was given the opportunity to pay for a manuscript assessment. Um, and I took my tutor up in that offer. Um, cleaned it up good as I could. Um, and I got brave one day and I thought, do you know something, I'm going to send this away to four agents in London. It was huge, you know, it was huge with yeah. my mum my behind me going, you can do it, you can do it, you know, you can do it. Let go of it. Um, it? But it's terrifying because it's like your baby. You know, like mm. I say, it's very insular. So you're, you're in this place yourself thinking, is it good enough? And the dream initially was just for one agent, even if I had to eventually send out to a hundred different people to say it's good enough. You know, and what came after it was just amazing, you know, because within three days of sending it out to those four agents, um, one of them phoned me and says, we'd like to offer you representation. Um, and yeah, I'm sure you'll hear me screaming from wherever you live. <laughs> um, it was amazing. It was amazing. And then, yeah, initially I got picked up by Random House in Germany. Wow. 
um, with Hold Your Tongue. And they've actually taken on both books and my debut releases in Germany in March. Um, and then Transworld came in just after that and offered me two books in the UK. Fantastic. So it was great. Just surreal, but yeah, great. So not only prize winning, but international. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Too modest for all of that. <laughs> but no, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was great. That'll be fascinating to see how they how Eve evolves in mm. the German translations of that yeah. and the whole process there. You mentioned that Eve came to being, the D.I. Hunter came to being because you had to think up a, a detective. Mm. So where did Eve come from? Did she tap you on the shoulder and say, hi, I'm here? Or did she sort of evolve over time as you developed it from this little scene mm. to the bigger story? Eve actually started off as a male. So we started off as D.I. Daniel Porter, and someone similar makes a little appearance in book two. But oh. because I'd, I'd read a lot, female and male detectives, but I just found myself always writing a male, even in my short stories and my flash fiction, I've no idea why, but I used to always write through the eyes of a male. Um, but what I found in Becoming was this stereotypical heavy drinker and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, there's definitely a place for that, you know. Um, but after it had gone all the way to going out to an agent and Random House and Transworld had accepted it. And then I decided, I think this needs to be a female. And I was so nervous going forward and said, I know it's a bit late in the game, but <laughs> is there any chance I could make it a girl? Uh, but thankfully they supported that. And I'm so glad I did because I, I love her as a character. And yeah, she just feels she should have been a woman. Fantastic. So. Did you find it easier to write her once? She became, she became a woman, but when she decided, actually, not Daniel, Eve, yeah. was it a bit easier to write her, or did it make no difference whatsoever? It was funny, because I remember going back through the manuscript and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to change all these he's to she's, and hmm. you know, this is going to be major. But what I really thought was going to be the biggest piece of work was changing from a male to female mannerisms and that, but I found she was such a strong character and I wanted her to be able to stand her ground with all these male detectives and everything. I didn't have to change too much of that. And she just, yeah, just seemed right as she was. Yeah. Know? So it was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Brilliant. And those of us who've read the books will know that she has her flaws as well. Mm. Um, she's not a drinker, but she has her flaws. She's had her troubled past. She's had her issues. Mm. And she's a fantastic character. They're all fantastic characters. I love the team that you've built around her. Thank you. Was it a conscious decision to build her into a team or was that something that you realised that actually if she's going to be a police detective she can't really be a, a rogue agent as it were? Yeah, I, I kind of wanted her to be difficult in her own ways, flawed because aren't we all, you know, but you know, I wanted her to also be loyal but I wanted to show within the team her weaknesses and her strengths. And I think the people are supporting kind of audience, if you know what I mean. Her support group allow her to do that. So the likes of Cooper is a real good sidekick for her. Love and him. where he can show emotion and he can do these things, he kind of drags her along. Mm -hmm. and she, she knows where her strengths are and where she leaves it to the rest of her team. Sure. And I wanted a bit of friction as well in the first book, definitely, mm -hmm. with the team, which... Um, I wanted her to hit the page running, really, um, coming back from a previous case and all the rest of it. Um, and things have kind of mellowed a bit in book two and again in book three because they're starting to become a bit more cohesive as a team. So Yeah, because you've got DS Mearns who comes in completely new, so we're learning everything from her perspective yeah. as well, and you've got Ferguson and Cooper and all the rest. Mm -hmm. So you definitely hit the ground running in the opening scene of Hold Your Tongue. If MD's read it, you know what I mean. I won't give away details if you've not, but it's, it's quite an opening. <laughs> where did you get that idea from? And to be honest, where do you get your ideas from? Because, well, you've said yourself, you are a single mum, you're juggling loads of things, you've got home life to deal with, you're still in Aberdeen, the lollipop lady who crossed you across the road crosses your wee girl and boy across the road. So how do you, how do you compartmentalise that? and then some pretty serious crime novels. Yeah. And where do your ideas come from then? Well, this is where I tell you that I hate the sight of blood. Um, you know, <laughs> like any programs like <laughs> that, like, 
<laughs> but for some reason, I can write it. And I don't know if it's because I've removed myself from it, but I can write it. But I've been told that the way I describe scenes, and it's really quite descriptive. But I think sometimes when you're writing like that, it's what happens in your own mind when you're reading. So you see in your own mind what you're reading. So when I'm told it's gory and everything else, I'm like, well, I kind of didn't really point towards it. And I didn't put a magnifying glass to it and blah, blah, blah. So really, it's what you're doing in your own head when you're reading, you know? Um, and I think sometimes when you, when you do that, that can be scarier than actually going into to real detail. But the ideas themselves, I guess, the first one, I'd always loved reading crime fiction and I, I loved a serial killer. You know, just <laughs> loved reading about serial killers. And I think there's a real fascination for everyone really underneath as to what drives these people, you know, what's going on in their heads, how they, you know, come to the, these acts and... And I just find it fascinating. So I used to read a lot of true crime and, and everything else. And I guess that experience, I suppose, of what you've read and watched and everything comes into what you write. Sure. So that was definitely for the first one. The second one I kind of held back a bit. And, but again, still a harrowing subject. Yeah, I mean, we won't go into details. If you've read it, you know what is about. But there are some serious topics and mm. um, themes that run through both your books. Um, and if you haven't, I won't give them away by spoiling where they go, but by all means, get hold of copies. They are good. But um, your books are very realistic, like you said. And OK, you don't like blood, but you do a great job of <laughs> describing <laughs> some, some scenes which are gory, but without taking too much. And you leave a lot to people's imagination, but so realistic. How did you get, and you love crime, and you've talked about the true crime books you read, mm -hmm. how did you get into the mindset of the police investigation? Because it, it's, it came across so real. Did you have to do quite a bit of research there? Or? No, I swear I put my tail between my legs and go, nope. <laughs> but I think more, I'd always watched crime dramas and films and everything else. And like I said, I'd always read it. So I really drew from my experience of doing that. I didn't actually go and meet with anyone or, yeah. I just, the first one was supposed to just be something just for me. So I didn't research it hard. I didn't see it being a police series. I didn't see that going. Like I say, all I wanted was an agent to say, it's good enough, anything else would have been a bonus. So I wasn't a great researcher. I have since spoke to some people, like for the, the second one, which um, very much, concentrates on an almost hidden Aberdeen human trafficking and stuff. You know, I, I watched a documentary which I found harrowing. So I went and spoke to an officer that deals with that in the North East. He was brilliant. Um, scary how much is going on under your nose. You think Aberdeen's, but yeah, you know, it, it is scary. But I find that very interesting, you know, finding out about your hometown and what's under your nose. And you don't always realise. So is it just what you've read, what you've seen? Yeah rather than ideas popping up as you're going for a walk, kind of yeah. thing. I think, I mean, I've, I've said it previously when I was interviewed, I think a big thing about crime fiction is it's exploding the darkness of life, it's exploding the, the scariness of life, but doing it from the safety of your sofa. Mm -hmm. So you can be taken on all these hard-hitting subjects, as you say, but you're safe, but you can let yourself go and find out about them. And very much that's what I do as a writer, you know, you just... You escape into these worlds, you create these worlds, but you're still touching upon reality. Yeah. And there's a lot of wrong turns and dead ends, mm. but like you say, you're creating these worlds. Are you quite a planner then? Okay, you don't do a lot of research. <laughs> do you? <laughs> but you've got a cast of characters, mm. loads of twists and turns. I'll be perfectly honest, I did not see the twist to the end of Out for Blood coming <laughs> at all. And then it came up and I was like, oh, right, okay. Um, do you plan how your story is going to go from the start, or are you more of a pantser and see where pantser. it goes? Pantser, right. which writing crime fiction probably isn't ideal, but it means kind of unpicking quite a bit, going back and writing. And yeah, I wish I was. However, um, yeah, I've kind of flown by the seat of my pants, book one, two, and three, but the fourth book that I'm just starting to plan now, um, I'm actually planning or trying to, <laughs> yeah. So, lesson learned. I'm hoping it won't be so much hard work this time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, whether I'm able to, you know, I might plan and still, yeah, headlights in the fog, but sure. 
I think everyone works differently. I think I'm very much a person, if I was to plan it to an inch of its life, I'd be bored of it because I'd know the story already. So I'd felt like it had already been told. Aye. You know, so I prefer just to find my way and see where I'm going. I like it. It evolves. Yeah. So it's almost like it's coming to you as a story yeah. as you're writing it. Now, you touched on, you don't do a lot of research, but you have met with a police detective. Indulge me, because I want to read the intro to the acknowledgements. I was chatting to Debbie about this earlier, and this just made me chuckle. If you've not read it, one, it intrigues me, your acknowledgements are at the back, not at the front, but it says, when I first sat down to write this, I was so excited and grateful that I was in danger of thanking everyone and their dog. So this is a paired back version, believe it or not. But I hope that those dogs know they are loved. Two full pages of acknowledgements. <laughs> a lot of people to thank. Very well, nice. <laughs> and you, you, you admit that you're, you're getting even better by the time you get through to the second. Well, after a severe case of the second book terrors and worrying whether I actually could write another one, it seems I got there in the end, but as with most things, I certainly wasn't alone in that. Mm. How much are you working with or reliant on other people as your book? Because we think of writers as you go away, you write a book, you're on your own. Yeah. You're in isolation. Well, not quite literally as we have been with Longtime, but you know. <laughs> How much do you work with other people to get your books from start to finish, from that initial idea to the fabulous books that we're holding in our hands? Um, really, for those two, for those two uh, well, hold your tongue when I went to the agent and the editor, as I say, was already written, because I'd done that through courses. Um, I didn't see it being a series. Okay. Um, as I say, I didn't know what was going to happen with it, but for us to put it out to publishers, we had to pitch it as a, a two-book deal. So all of a sudden I was grappling, going, oh my goodness, I've only ever wrote one book and I don't have an idea for a second one. You know, where do you get ideas from? But um, thankfully, you know, like I say, it came on the back of a documentary and I thought, yeah, I'd really like to explore that. So I went off and did that, but I very much just pitched it, a very short pitch, and then I went off and thankfully they believed in me enough to let me go and write it. So they just left me and the first they ever saw of it was when I put in a first draft. Um, and then what happens is the editor obviously gives you your um, suggestions and improvements and you go away and you work on it again. Um, and that, that's very much how it's been about. And the same with the, the third one that I've just finished. Um, yeah, that was a few extensions over the lockdowns. <laughs> um, but again, they hadn't seen it, they just trusted that it'd be okay. So I'm, I'm really lucky with them, you know, and they're, it's a great team round about me. Trans world. Um, but yeah, back to basics, without it being the professional side of it, friends, family, keep my boy, you know, um, without playing my mini violin, but I, I lost my mum two years ago. Yeah. Um, my kids lost their dad and stuff, so a lot of my childcare options went out the window. So it, it can be hard, but at the same time, it's a sanity. That, that's what keeps you going, you yeah. know, because you're just, you're escaping from everything that's going on. And I think a lot of saying I don't like blood and all these things, I think a lot of things that scare me or frustrations or hard times in life goes into there, you know? Yeah. yeah. You've clearly got an amazing support network around you, mm. both in your personal life and in your professional life mm. with the Trans World team and your agents and things like that. Was there anything in the process of getting published that, really surprised you because I mean we all think we know how a book gets published but until you're actually yeah. involved in it it's actually a far more complex yeah she, process um, is there anything that jumped out for you that was like oh I didn't know that or every every other week you know <laughs> is it it's a learning experience but um you think oh you know I've got an agent and that's great and you know and now I've got a publisher this is fantastic but you don't see how much work goes on behind the scenes how much people are championing you and they're, they're bringing it forward, but just the process of it. Mm. You know, you, you do these edits, like I say, they come back, you get another round of edits, then they come back and then you've got copy edits and then you've got proofreads. But at the same time, you're trying to write the next one, you know, but you're having to go back to this one that you feel that like you've read 1,500 times by now, you know. But there's a promotion of it. You know, there's a yeah. lot of self-promotion now that you have to be out and not out on the road, but you have to be on social media and be visible. And, and I love that because it mm -hmm. gets you face to face with your readers, you know, and I love it. And, and this, you know, <laughs> my second one. But um, 
No, it's fantastic. And to hear what people think about it just really spurs you on to keep going, you know. Sure. But, um, yeah, it's a big machine. It's a big machine. And then you start learning about all the sales. And, and I thought, if you get a book um, published, it just it goes into all the bookshops and it goes into all the supermarkets. But it doesn't. It goes out as a package. And your publisher puts out as a package and then it's decided whether you're going to hit a supermarket shelf. It's decided what bookshops you're going to hit whether they're the big ones, the independents, and, you know. Um, and it's a scary time, because it's like, is it actually going to make it onto shelves? And, yeah. And then it's all about sales and money. But at the same time, it's never taken the enjoyment out of it for me, you know. It's still, still the enjoyment there. Oh, that's good. So how then did you go from not knowing whether it'd end up on bookshelves? Because mm. I must admit, didn't know that process, and it's all... That's quite fascinating. How then did you go from that to being not just shortlisted, but winning the Scottish Debut Crime of the Year Award last year? Because you've only just handed your crown yeah. over to Ronnie. I think, I mean, that was, a, that was a publisher thing of, you know, these, these things come up throughout the year and they'll, they'll send in your work on the off chance, you know. Didn't believe for one second. I mean, I'd been going to bloody Scotland Festival on my own for, for years as a reader um, and going to things like this and sit and just listen to their process and just, you know, people I loved reading. Um, and there was all that sneaky thing in the background of imagine if one day I was on a poster somewhere or imagine if, you know, just someone knew my name, just one person, you know, and just for something I'd written. And I think there was that drive. Um, but to go 360 degrees and be nominated, wow, you know, that was enough. But never in my, and I know everyone says it, but honestly, never in my wildest dreams did I think that I'd win it. And that was glaringly apparent in my acceptance speech, oh my goodness. But it was online on Zoom, you know, and because lockdown couldn't be there in person, which was a shame, but I was just a jittering wreck. You know, it was just, I was just expecting someone else's name and it was like a rabbit in the headlights and then like, you know, and out there for everyone to see forever on YouTube. Like, great, <laughs> lovely, a bit like this tonight. <laughs> but, but, oh, wonderful experience. Again, screaming, running around the house. So and the kids going, here she goes again. <laughs> so, but, yeah. You must have been so chuffed, though. I was, I was, I really was. Um, yeah, it was just, just amazing. So I hope to get there in person again before... For a long September, I think, so yeah. get down there and see what's going on next year, you know, because we're going back to normality slowly but surely. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed indeed. But um, with that, you've also got your social media mm. and that's sort of brought you to a lot of people's attention. Mm. And as you said, you love getting in touch with everybody, Zoom and things like that. And maybe people don't know this yet because you're still quite new as a group, but the Caledonian Crime, Crime Collective, I can't even say it tonight, sorry. It is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> the Caledonian is. Crime Collective. I go with CCC most of the time. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> How did that all get started and come about? And who are they? Tell, uh, tell us more about it them. It was actually the brainchild of Emma Christie, who writes psychological thrillers in her debut um, very, very well. And she got in touch with me via Twitter and said, you know, I'm looking to bring a band of Scottish writers together, um, wondering if you'd be interested. I said, I would love to, you know. Um, and then she asked if I had any suggestions and I brought on board Marion Todd, who's also very prolific and stuff and doing great. Um, yeah, and then we all just came together and it's basically seven crime writers, Scottish crime writers, we're all coming together to do events to support one another, to support other debuts, to support fellow authors. Um, yeah, and we've got ideas for a lot of fun stuff ahead just to promote each other, but also support those coming up behind us. Um, yeah, fellow authors, whether that's going to be live talks, events. Um, and we have our launch down in Stirling on the 28th of this month at Booknook. Fantastic. So, yeah, it's, it's a great thing to be a part of, you know, it just celebrating Scottish writing and, and amongst like-minded people, it's fantastic. Do you find you bounce ideas off of them as well, or yeah. do they help read any of your 
Yeah, we've got a pieces. WhatsApp group, so there's days where like, <laughs> you know, and then there's other days where we're just all the good news and everything, you know. So you've got people, like say, when you're in there trying to hit deadline and stuff, that you can share that with um, things you're celebrating, you can share it with. And we've got some great ideas coming up. I don't know what road we'll take with it, mm. but we would like to... Um, just, I don't know, maybe do workshops, do interactive panels, things like that, where launch is actually going to be very interactive with the audience. Um, and just a bit of a, a laugh, fun and frolics, and bringing Scottish writing to people. Fantastic. It sounds brilliant. Now, I have to ask, there was a couple of us um, staff were chatting beforehand, and Colly Dallas and I were chatting, we're like, you know, you've got Stuart McBride and Claire and uh, Shona, you've got Logan McRae, Alexander Seaton, now you've got Eve Hunter. Can nobody write romantic comedy in Aberdeen? <laughs> <laughs> what is it about Aberdeen that makes it oh, so... It's really light? funny because I remember being down at Bloody Scotland and I was in a room where Stuart McBride was talking mm. and uh, I was getting up the courage, you know, to ask a question on the mic and it was like a huge room full of people. And I remember saying to him at the time, the opposite. I said, why do you think there's only yourself really at the top of the crime writing game within Aberdeen? It's all down Glasgow and Edinburgh. And why do you think it's never been tapped upon? And Stuart in his usual humour, and I did giggle, he says, it's because I'm the best and you know, no, one's, <laughs> no one's come up behind me yet. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> so it seemed a very untapped area for crime fiction for a while. Um, and I didn't see why, because it's so... The weather, you know, the, the rain and the wind and the, the coolness of the granite and, you know, just the region, North Sea. And it, it's just perfect backdrop mm. for crime fiction and murder and mayhem. You know, it just it lends itself perfectly. <laughs> so was it a conscious decision then to oh, yeah. sit in Aberdeen? To say right what you know. And I, I had a little bash at writing something based in America. And, you know, I think I got to two chapters, as I said, you know. <laughs> um... But yeah, I mean, you live here, you know how it, how it operates, how it works, what the social divides are and... Sure, you've got that knowledge. Yeah, you can tap into things you already know. Although was that also then a challenge? Because I'm just thinking, in some ways it might be helpful to set a story in a city, you know, but equally you've got mm. to make sure that you don't actually name check too many like in the second book, we've got restaurateurs and entrepreneurs. Yeah. I do remember writing the first one, and there was a there was a murder in the Mulmason Hotel, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I did worry about that a little bit. I thought, I wonder how the Aberdeen Tourist Board is going to be loving me after this. But <laughs> thankfully, I never got an email or a phone call of complaining, so I think I got away with it. But so far, <laughs> so far. <laughs> It is brilliant. I mean, they are fantastic. You have do such a good job of describing the city in a really nice, balanced way. Thank you. Um, but I want to ask you about the covers, if I may. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was chatting to something, and somebody I heard once said, books sell them, good books sell themselves, which, given that, as you said, you've been in lockdown, this is only your second in-person event where you've mm. had the chance to meet audiences, yours very much have. Now, I know we all like to say that we never choose a book by our cover, but let's be honest, we're certainly influenced by them, and they are fabulous, fabulous um, covers. Sorry, I'm holding them in such a way that you might not be able to I'll see them properly. I'll give a shout to Becky Kelly at Transwell. She's fantastic. She's done a brilliant job with them. Yeah, she really and is fab. Your third book, um, From the Ashes, you just released the cover for that. Mm -hmm. announced just last week on social media, yeah. How much are you involved in the creation of the covers then? Um, I do. I do get a say. They go off and design them. The, the first one, very much, came to me as it is, and I loved it. I just thought it was different. It was. It was simple. You know. I just. I loved it. The second one, it came out initially as lime green, and I was like, mm, not sure. I'd be looking for cookery books on there. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and they took on board what I said, and they says, look, yep, we'll go orange. Um, I'm very lucky with my team, you know, I, I, they're just brilliant in their support. And I like the way that the three books now have that orange mm. kind of tie through the three of them. So, yeah, it makes them stand out a little. They certainly do. They're very eye-catching on the shelf yeah. as well, which is great. But that's really interesting. So, From the Ashes, the cover was released mm -hmm. last week. It's due out in June. 
Yeah, June next year. Yeah. How are Eve and the team? What can you tell us about them? Where is it going? Because we left them in a very interesting position of they've sorted the crime. Mern's from Bolton is slowly settling in. She's moved into her own place. She's slowly letting go of the grip that our parents have of her. Mm. Ferguson, we're starting to see chinks in his armour. Mm. Cooper, there's a wee bit of family life's not quite the balance that they want, but then they end on a happy note. Mm -hmm. And Eve is slowly getting back into her old self, her old ways, despite all that she's been through in the first two books. Yeah. Where are they going to? What can you tell us? I think what I want to do with the third book, because the first book was such an exploration of Eve, really, in yeah. Ferguson. The second one, and Mearns, but the second one kind of showed a different side to Cooper, give a bit more about his background. And what I really wanted to do with books, he was delve a little bit more into D.I. Ferguson. Yeah, Ferguson, D.S. Ferguson. So I wanted to delve a bit more into his background. So without giving too much away, it, yeah, it really delves deeper into his character. But um, it starts, starts off with a fire at a children's home within Aberdeen. Um, and basically that uncovers a, a past mystery. So. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> My editor phoning me going, hello, too much. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us are going, come on then. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say without giving too much of oh, so no. I'll stop there. But is, is Cooper okay and everything's all right? And we've still got Cooper, we've say. still got Ferguson. Can't possibly we'll say. Sorry. Sorry, no. I did try. <laughs> But it is fantastic that we're now on to the third book and From the Ashes. And you've got another book coming after that, Yeah, this you? one, um, there's three in the D.I. Eve Hunter series. I hope there'll be a fourth, but we don't, I don't know because I'm um, you know, contracted at the moment for the three. But I'm also contracted for a fourth book, um, which is going to be a standalone thriller, also oh. based in Aberdeen. Um, a romantic but, comedy? No, sorry. Oh, okay. I, don't, I don't think I'd write them. You know, the boyfriend <laughs> would die halfway through or something. I can't, no. But, um, yeah, so that's going to be exciting because I'm just writing something brand new. Um, I'll miss the characters, but I'm looking forward to just writing about someone that I haven't explored at all. It's something totally different. And then we'll see if we get a fourth in the D.I.U. Hunter. Crossed. That would be fantastic if you do. Because there's a couple of themes that run through the book, whether it's a conscious decision or not, of like mm. revenge and vengeance. Mm. Have you followed those themes on into the third book? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Is that all you can tell us? Yeah. <laughs> I'm really rubbish at like actually talking about it without giving too much away. I'll be like, and then this happens, and this happened, and then this. No. So don't. Don't tease me because I'll give it all away. <laughs> okay. It is, I mean, it is quite hard to not give away a crime yeah. book without the twists and the turns going, but was there anything about these two books that you loved the most writing? Mm. Or is there something you missed out in them that you think, oh, I wish I'd added that in? I think what I loved the most about Hold Your Tongue was the prologue. And purely because oh, yeah. it was more or less as I had written it on the Faber course. So as it had started um, and it remained as it was right up until it went on the shelf. And I just loved the opening to that um, book purely because it was me exploding who I was as a writer, seeing if I could kind of just be a little bit gritty and dark and explore that side of myself. And the fact it stayed there, I was, yeah, that was a particular favorite, the opening to that book. Um, Cause it was the first thing I tried to, to write, you know? So yeah, that is a, spe a special place, sorry. Um, I'm not crying by the way, that was a frog in my throat. It's not that special, but. <laughs> and then, um, Out for Blood. I don't know, I think with that one, all I wanted to do was bring a very harrowing situation to the forefront without the sensationalism, and I hope I've done that. I, I wanted it to come across sensitively what these women are going through. Um, yeah, and I think that's something I didn't enjoy, but was conscious of sure. in there. But no, I don't think I, don't think I have any regrets in anything being missed out. I'm learning all the time, I'm a new writer, you know. I don't read them once they're written. If I was to write them, I'd probably go, oh, my goodness. But, but that's a personal thing, because I hope I'm getting 
better as I go, but no regrets. You know, they are what they are, and I did my best at the time. Oh, no, they're amazing. Yeah. It's just, you know, that way when you think... Yeah. But you save those ideas for a future book. Yeah. There is, there is themes within them and things I'd like to explore as I sure. go along, if I'm given the opportunity. So, fingers crossed. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. I think I'm going to open the floor to questions from the audience and online. Um, as we do, if you could just give us a second for the mic to come to you so that we can all hear you both online and in the room. If you could just put up your hand and my glamorous assistant Ruth will get to you with the mic. Does anybody have a question to get us started? Gentlemen down the front. What like was it the first time you described yourself as an author? When somebody asked you, what do you do? And you said for the first time, I'm an author. That was amazing. You know, it was just, yeah. So it was a dream. I still to this day feel a bit silly. If somebody says, what do you do? I go, oh, I kind of write stories. You know, it just, <laughs> yeah. But it is, it's an amazing feeling to be able to say that you're, you're living your dream, you know. And the, one of the, the best things that I take out of that is for the kids, you know, just... My children saying, look, if you want to chase it, you can. You know, and you just never know what's going to happen. So, But yeah, it's, it's a fantastic feeling. Thank you. Ruth. Do you still read as much now that you're writing? I try to. I don't have the, the same time, but sometimes I find as well, if I'm, if I'm reading while I'm writing, it takes me out of... What I'm doing, and then you have that imposter like syndrome thing of oh, never got right as good as that, so I might as well give up, lap down, down, you know. But yeah, I try to um, and support fellow authors and read their stuff and sing about their stuff on social media when I can. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Who is your favourite crime author? <sighs> oh, that's a difficult one. Other than yourself. That's a pfft, that's a difficult one. Do you know something? The crime writing industry or field is such a friendly group. They're so welcoming. And everyone's at the top of their game. You know, they really are. But if I was to say my early influences, Mark Billingham, you know, I absolutely loved Mark Billingham's stuff. And that's what really got me into police procedurals. And then when Stuart McBride started his stuff, somebody was writing in my hometown, you know. Then, yeah, explored him and that. But are far too many in the I, I love heaps of different people for different reasons. So, but thank you. Who's yours? Not me. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Oh, so many. See, uh, see, it's I difficult. Know, it's see? I like to yeah. bat that question back. <laughs> oh, no, no. About this one. Who's your favourite serial killer then, if you like true crime? What's the, who's the serial killer that really you're just fascinated by, whether it be Bundy or, you know, Richard Ramirez or... No, I just, I just, uh, just anything that's serial killer and police procedure I devour. I don't know, you'll know yourself. It's just, it's just that the, what makes them tick. Just find it fascinating. I really do. Um, like I say, from a safety or sofa. <laughs> so. Anyone else? If it wasn't a crime, what else would it be, or could it be, that you fancy writing about? Oh. I used to write little short stories that I thought was funny, but I'm not sure anybody else did. <laughs> so I kind of knew early on I wasn't going to be doing that kind of stuff. But I used to pen little short stories. Um, but yeah. Sorry, some of them were good. Yeah, it's my, one of my childhood pals up the back. But <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about one of them, OK? <laughs> Oh, well, see, now you have yeah. to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's the only other thing I kind of poured about with, but no. I was going to ask that question. That's a good question. I quite like that. I always wondered about, you know, if crime writers wrote something else, what would it be? Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. But do you have another genre you would write if you didn't write crime? I'd love to explore psychological thrillers if I wasn't in crime, mm -hmm. which is still on the threshold of it, yeah. but... You know, not police procedural, which I'm getting an opportunity to do with book four, so. Ah. 
yeah, I'm quite looking forward to that. I'm not uh, confined to the restraints of police procedures and rules and, you know, procedures and stuff, so. Exciting. Yeah. But definitely but not freedom. romantic comedy. No. no. <laughs> you're trying, you are trying, you are <laughs> well, trying. you know. <laughs> We've got a question coming online that asks, with your experience of trying to work at home and meet deadlines during the pandemic, um, do you think that The Shining is no longer a horror story or film, but now a sympathetic <laughs> portrayal of a writer trying to finish a project while confined with their family? <laughs> I'll just say a big fat yes to that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's definitely an eye-opener. But, you know, I'm not doing anything different from anybody else that was writing in lockdown, and hats off to all of them, you know. Hats off to all of them. Anybody that was working in any kind of job in lockdown, you know, just... Yeah, but we got through it. We're out the other end of it. So hopefully, hopefully. fingers crossed. Indeed. Anybody yeah. else got any other questions in the room? In that case, I'm going to bring it back to me and ask you a question. It's a variation on a theme. I'm always intrigued because you said you've got a lot of influences. Mark mm. Billingham, you've um, checked Stuart McBride, yeah. who'll be joining us on Saturday. Mm -hmm. If there was ever anyone's book that you were, you were like, oh, I, I love that, or I wish I could write that, or is there anyone's book that you would love to steal from or borrow? Because we all borrow ideas from each other. Is there anyone, any standout that you think, I'd do that? I used to think that when I used to write, read Stephen King in my teens. Stephen King, I used to always think to myself, wow, he's just fantastic. Any one of his books, probably, yeah. If I could have stole it and went, I wrote that, then yeah. But no, he's... He's very good at what he does and uh, is who he is for a reason. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah. <laughs> Scaring us all from the comfort of our own exactly. home in his own wee way as yeah. well. Now, we have been touching on the fact that there's a book coming out in June mm -hmm. from the ashes. Yep. And you won't tell us how much more about Eve Hunter because <coughs> you're cruel and evil that way. And <laughs> to be fair to your editor, she wants to keep that, to, they want to keep that to themselves. But are you allowed to read us a wee extract or anything? Yeah, I could read the opening to book three. Um, Give us a sneaky peek. A sneaky because peek to book three. Um, this, is, this is actually chapter one. It's just a short extract. Um, and yeah, this is the, the fire taking hold at the children's home. It was the sound. That's what drew him in. The seconds of silence watching as the flame caught orange tinged yellow, sparking before growing and picking up speed, the poor buggers inside unaware of the nightmare headed their way. And then the roar as the beast found its fuel, crackling, popping rage as it moved, spreading across the floor, licking at the walls, a desire to, to devour everything in its path, eager and wanting more. The open window of the room where the fire was coming to life glowed orange as he moved, he kept to the edges of the garden, making use of the darkness, knowing he had to get around the building and down the drive, hidden before the alarm sounded and sleeping neighbours across the road were drawn zombie-like to their windows and doors. He slinked down the drive, crossed the pavement and turned back towards the house, the tall hedge hiding him from view. He stepped back, branches pressing into his hoodie, leaves rustling against his jeans. His eyes closed savouring the moment before the chaos, letting the noise wash over him, comfort and excitement as he listened, the fire sounding oddly like torrential rain as it burned, the gush of a river fit to burst its banks. He opened his eyes when the fire alarm sounded, white grey smoke now billowing from the building as the beast belched. Time for the fun to begin. He stared at the building, the only sign of the fire being the smoke visible above the roof, but he knew that the blaze around the back would be in full flow now. He wanted to feel the heat of it pressing against his face, to stand still as the fire warmed his body and emptied his mind. That was his definition of home. Are you sure you won't let us know any more about you, Phantom? I could go on from there, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so remind us again, when is that coming out? It's due out June next year. Fantastic. So we've not got that much longer to wait for it. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. And what about your follow-on, the, the standalone? When, what kind of timeline are you working to? Do you, are you writing that while you're waiting for your book three to, yeah. to be published? Yeah, or at least trying to plan it. 
at the moment. So, yeah, and then, yeah, I'll be writing that as we're waiting for copy edits and proofreads and things. How does proofreading work? Is that quite a challenge? No, I don't actually proofread it. It goes out to the proofreader and then it comes to me for a final check. So then I have to read it all again and then hope that, yeah, I don't make too much changes and get into trouble. <laughs> so, we'll see. Is there a day that you've got to just let it go from? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's when your editor says, that's enough, we're done. And then it's, it's away. Let so, it be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll see. That is fantastic. I must admit, I am desperate to find out where you take Eve and Cooper and Ferguson and Merrins because they are fantastic. If you've not yet read them, then please do get your hands on a copy. It took me a while to get hold of our copies. I was telling this to Deborah. I had to put in reserves for these because all our copies were out on loan for weeks and weeks and weeks and I couldn't get hold of them. It's like, <laughs> I want to read them. <laughs> um, to hear. <laughs> so we do have both of Deborah's current books, Hold Your Tongue and Out for Blood, um, in the libraries if you want to borrow them, both physical and digital copies on our Borrow Box collection as well. They can be read as standalones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they do work really well as. And I really want you all to tell me about the twist at the end and let me know what you thought about it because I, that really took me by surprise. Your, your ability for twists <laughs> and turns and you think you're reading one thing and it goes another were just fabulous. Thank you. And when it comes out, the new book from the ashes will be available from Watersons. Our colleagues Watersons are here from all good bookshops and from your local library. So please do pop in and we will be getting copies of it as soon as it's in. But Deborah Mason, thank you so very much for a fabulous evening chatting to us. If, does anybody have any last questions for Deborah? Other than when, we can get, when can we get our hands on your next book? <laughs> Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much. Good luck with the new book. Thank you. We look forward to welcoming you back and either on your own or with the Caledonian Crime Collective. But ladies and gentlemen, please, Thank you so much for joining us here in the library. Thank you for joining us online, wherever you are watching us online. But please join me in thanking Deborah Mason. Thank you. Thank you.